The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. I was here once before in October with uh, Martha, Martha Herbert, who's a friend and also a collaborator. Um, and that's when I first met people from this group, mm -hmm. including Matthew. And since then, we've actually started collaborating. So that's very exciting. Um, I'm being monitored today right here. Yep. And so when it really dips, when it really dips down very low, that's a myocardial infarction. So that would be the end of the lecture. <laughs> um, so basically, um, you see the topic, but the main point I'll give right at the front, which is that I don't believe that any serious progress on the topic that I'm going to talk about today will be made unless three fields of knowledge are integrated. Those three fields are biomedical science, behavioral psychology, and technology, which is you. So that's really the reason I'm here. Um, and what I have to say is based on uh, 36 years of work now, and I've seen during that period of time approximately 4,000 people um, with autism. Uh, and so my summary, basically, it's really, it's not a guess what I'm talking about today. It's a synthesis. <laughs> all right. So the first question, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, and I know, Matthew, this is, I'm late in the course, so I'm going to assume that you know certain things about autism, and I'm not going to review that at all. Um, but the fundamental question today has to do with problem behavior, um, and that is, you know, basically, what is it? to begin with. Uh, and so what we're dealing with are things like, oh, I, I have a pointer here. What we're dealing with are things like aggressive behavior, um, particularly physical aggression. Um, and uh, at the start of my career, actually, I started my career as an experimental psychologist. It was totally lab. It was animal lab and everything. But from that knowledge base uh, came the idea of applications. And that actually led to the entire field of applied behavior analysis, which comes from basic research uh, with actually animal models. But I didn't want to spend my whole life in an animal lab, so I made the jump to UCLA where they have applied. And I'm sure Matthew mentioned Lovas, who was responsible for a lot of this. And that was my mentor back then. Um, and really, very, very early in my career, I discovered the meaning of aggressive behavior because there was a guy who was my height but he had biceps worked for maybe three times mine, and I work out. Um, and what he did is I didn't read his facial expression and body language correct, and in one second he wheeled around and he bit me right in here. Where, um, and actually, you know, you watch Law and & Order, the expression through and through. <laughs> and the, you're also familiar with the expression to bring one to one's knees. Yes, it's true. <laughs> I actually went to my knees when he did that. And so that was my uh, introduction to the concept of aggressive behavior in autism. Uh, and so basically what happens is people, uh, a very large percentage of people uh, with autism will engage in these behaviors largely because they don't have any other way of communicating. And so when they're frustrated, uh, when things are pent up and they can't meet their needs, they go for you. Um, and that's sort of their way of communicating. Uh, and if you understand that, then you realize it's not psychotic or random or aberrant or anything. It's actually adaptive. And that's why it lasts forever and is exhibited all over the place. Uh, verbal aggression is self-explanatory. Destroys property is self-explanatory. Okay, those are aggression. Self-injury is the most extreme human behavior that you will ever see. Um, and I can give you an example again. One week into my, was a postdoc, one week into my postdoc, uh, I was at a uh, facility where they had a kid in four-point restraints. It's called spread eagle. He's on a bed spread eagle like this. And the reason why is that when you unleashed him from that, he would start smashing his head. And when I first met him, I could actually see through his skull. So I could actually see through his skull. And that was like one week into this postdoc. And I was thinking, gee, I wonder what real estate would be like as a career. <laughs> because this was like alarming. Um, and uh, uh, another thing, uh, just to give you a, a, some idea of the seriousness of this uh, and why people are um, interested in doing something about it, another thing is, like, let's suppose that's a concrete wall right ahead of me. And this is the sort of thing that I have seen. A guy basically winding up and charging it like a bull, full force, right into a concrete wall. And once the person hits, you see a blood splatter 
go up on the wall. Um, and so this is the sort of thing that is quite alarming to people. And you imagine if you were, God forbid, a parent of something like that, how you would respond. Um, and then the other thing, there's no filing cabinets in here. Oh, I was going to give my filing cabinet demonstration. Let's pretend this is a filing cabinet. You know those metal filing cabinets with the point in the end? Okay, so people just sort of wind up and just like that, right on the corner of the filing cabinet. And so basically people see this and it looks completely, quote, irrational and psychotic. It's not. It's fear provoking. But in life, the cure for fear is knowledge. <laughs> Okay, that's what the, that's what we're why that's why we seek knowledge. By the way, uh, knowledge is processed in your cerebrum, but it's motivated from the amygdala. Uh, and basically, uh, what it is is people look at that kind of behavior and they say, you know, why would that ever happen? That's completely counterintuitive. Why anyone would hurt themselves that way? But as we'll see in a minute, there are reasons. There are lots of reasons, and if you understand those reasons, you can actually do something. But in order to fully understand it, you have to do lots of other things that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, tantrums, again, these are all self-explanatory, so I'm not going to go into it. Tantrums, non tantrums, by the way, don't mean like a toddler tantrums for like five, ten minutes. We're talking about like three, four hours, that kind of thing. Um, often uh, built up to such an intensity that if you tantrum long enough, you start to engage in what's called operant vomiting, which is like you become so agitated that you actually become sick. And so these are really serious behaviors. Uh, Noncompliance is actually when people say, oh, I have a problem, it's noncompliance. I say, that's it? <laughs> you should be sacrificing sheep to Zeus uh, <laughs> if that's your problem. <laughs> because these are the problems. Noncompliance is something that's annoying. Uh, repetitive behavior stereotypy, I'm sure Matthew has covered this in spades, uh, and that is another issue. Um, and then disruptive behavior, which is a large number of sort of obnoxious, irritating behaviors, but not quite as dangerous, but quite pervasive. Okay, so that's what we mean when I say what is, you know, when we're talking about problem behavior, that's what I mean by problem behavior. The next issue, of course, is why is problem behavior important? And the reason why it's important in, to sum up is basically uh, that it ruins everything which means that you can teach a child with autism uh, cognitive skills or social skills or independence or anything else, okay? At the, at the end of the day, if they have the behaviors I just described, any of them, they're done. They will not go to a neighborhood school. They will not be able to live with their parents after a period of time. Uh, they will probably wind up in an institution. They will never get a job later in life. No one will go near them. If they are in a regular school and they start behaving like that, all children will avoid them. And basically, you know what the modal number of friends are for a person with autism? Zero. The modal number is zero. Uh, and there's not much variance. <laughs> um, and the reason for that is the kinds of behaviors I'm talking about. And so, um, what it does then is it prevents full community integration. I just reviewed that. Uh, demoralizes family members, parents and siblings. It particularly demoralizes teachers, are petrified when they get somebody like that in their classroom. Uh, even so-called uh, higher function or Asperger's. Um, am I positioned incorrectly? No? Um, if that in your way, we can move this? Oh, yeah. No, it's not. Maybe just push it over by the door or something. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. It's okay. Um, Increasing the likelihood of institutionalization, without any doubt. Uh, that's where people cluster when they have these kinds of behaviors. Problem is that when you are in an institution, you lose all choice in life. And there are data showing that the fewer choices a person has, the more likely they are to act out. <laughs> and that's universal. Almost everything I'm saying, by the way, applies to everybody, including those who don't have autism. It's just that people with autism are like everybody else, only more so. Um, rejection by others, again, that's the end of any kind of social network with that kind of behavior. Uh, and then those who can talk, typically Asperger's, uh, will express shame or regret over their behavior uh, and they're miserable because of that. So how would you summarize the issue of why is problem behavior important? Fundamentally because it destroys quality of life. Which means that when we treat problem behavior, we never just do it to get rid of the behavior. We always do it in such a way that it actually improves the person's quality of life. Because if you don't do that, you haven't done anything. If you just get rid of something bad, but don't put in anything good, then what have you done? You've produced somebody that's quiet and complacent and basically easy to control, and that's nothing. 
Okay, so then we get to the really um, fundamental question, which is, um, what is our understanding? And the, the basic point here is this, that I get this all the time. People say, oh, so-and-so is self-injurious, or so-and-so is aggressive. Um, what do I do about it? And I'll say, well, first of all, we have to understand it. Don't worry about understanding. Just tell me what to do. And that would be the equivalent of medicine, of somebody coming in sick and say, oh, I don't want to understand. I'll just give you things. You have a, a stomach pain? Uh, take Alka-Seltzer. Say, well, what happens if it's cancer? Uh, oh, I guess the Alka-Seltzer wouldn't help. Uh, basically, uh, it's critical to actually devote a lot of time and thought to understanding because treatment is easy. Understanding is difficult. If you understand something, the treatments follow very logically and rationally and prescriptively and it's not a big issue. Uh, and so therefore that's why we spend so much time on the issue of understanding. Uh, and basically there's th the thrust of all this is that um, problem behaviors have triggers and they have payoffs. Certain things that set it off and certain things that pay it off. And that's what keeps it going forever and ever. And problem behaviors are robust. They don't, people don't outgrow them. When they're successful, they last forever. And what happens over time is they tend to get worse, not better. And so therefore, that's why it's so important to actually understand what's going on. Um, and in fact, there are data, and I've done several meta-analyses. Actually, the, the government keeps commissioning us, various branches of the government. I guess they don't talk to each other, the different branches. But um, NIH, I did a, a meta-analysis for NIH another one for U.S. Department of Education, and the most recent one for the National Academy of Sciences. And every one of them showed the same meta-analysis, even though they were uh, a decade apart each, which is that your chance of successfully treating problem behavior is twice as great if you base the treatments on an assessment where you understand it. If you just do a fishing expedition, let's try this, let's try that. There's nobody in here in psychiatry, right? Okay, so I can trash psychiatry. Um, Basically, that's psychiatry. Oh, so-and-so's aggressive? Oh, my God, we'll do risperidone. It didn't work. Oh, my God, we'll do Abilify. Oh, it didn't work. We'll do Selexa. We'll do Citalopram. We'll do Prozac. That's nothing. That's, the op that's what's called anti-intellectual behavior. That leads to nothing. That is a catastrophe. The only people that are happy are Glaxo, Pfizer. Okay, they're, they're happy. AstraZeneca. So basically, we don't do that. We don't think that's a good idea at all. There's something else that's better. And that's basically to assess what the triggers are and what the payoffs are. Common triggers include things, unfortunately, like academic demands. You try to teach somebody, the kid goes berserk. They don't want to do it. They're cognitively challenged to begin with a lot of them. There's social cues there involved. There's emotional cue reading. All of these things, no good. Don't like it. Boom, that's a trigger. Um, home chores, work tasks, that's why people can't get jobs. That's on the trigger side. On the payoff side, I've devoted a whole slide to this. These classes of controlling variable, which are the payoff for human behavior, basically, cuts across everyone. Doesn't matter if you have autism or not, all people are motivated this way. And the basic idea behind all this is this. To understand human behavior, function is more important than form. The why is more important than the what. That's fundamental. And so therefore, we spend a lot of time answering the question, why? And why has different words in English. It can be the motivation for the behavior, reinforcement, function, purpose, intent. They're all the same. Different words, the same idea. And so what are the um, purposes or motivation for behavior, including the extreme ones that I've mentioned? These are the main ones. Uh, attention seeking, clearly, if I rush at that filing cabinet, smash my head against the corner, you will attend. You're not going to say, oh, that was interesting. He smashed his head and he's bleeding. You won't do that. You say, you'll rush over. Oh, my God. You know, you, you know, and that's exactly what people do. And, you, and I always know when there's an episode because I see somebody on the floor and like five adults around them. I, and I know already, okay, I, I already know what's happened. Okay. So attention seeking is certainly very effective. Uh, social avoidance, uh, kids with autism, not so fond of other people. Uh, not interested. People come up, you know, hi, hi, how are you? You know, okay, well, you get bit. <laughs> All right? Or somebody, was sm or the kid responds by smashing themselves in the face. You back off. That's social avoidance. That behavior is being used essentially like language to say, leave me alone. <laughs> okay? Back off. I don't want to interact with you. 
uh, task avoidance. Okay, class, we're all doing our, you know, do this work, okay? And then as soon as the teacher puts down, starts making the demands, the kid will trash the desk, flip the desk over, bite the teacher, teacher backs off, says, oh, we're not doing schoolwork today. That's called task avoidance. Uh, so again, a very effective way of getting what you want, given that you're not a good communicator. Uh, tangible seeking. Uh, actually, you don't have to have autism to see this. That's all you have to do is go to a supermarket on Saturday afternoon with the mothers with their little boys, typically, and they're on the candy aisle, and the kid wants something. The mother says, not now. The kid wants something, not now. And then the kid collapses on the floor screaming, and then the mother notices 90 people and start looking at her, and so she puts her foot down and says, okay, just one cookie. That's the kiss of death if you do that, because <laughs> now the kid's learned, if I accelerate high enough, <laughs> my mother will cave and I will get that. So from now on, that's what I'm going to do. So that's tangible motivation. Um, sensory reinforcement, basically a lot of behaviors, and this, is, by the way, is very common among stereotypical behaviors, where you see people who do things like, there's no light switches. Oh, there is. Oh, what a break. This, well, this won't turn the power off on your machine there, will it? Okay. Oh, okay, good. This is... This, I actually published this. Okay, this. Oh, oh, it doesn't go on. Uh, oh, oh, this. Yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> that's that's more like it. Okay, when people do that, and you see the kid look, looking like that, what they're doing is they're using their problem behavior to generate interesting sensory displays. Uh, and the kids will do things like that, lots of things. And it looks like stereotype behavior. Well, of course, it is by definition. But what's driving it is none of the things I just mentioned. What's driving it is sensory displays. They find that very interesting. And so do teenage boys at arcades. <laughs> it's the same motivation. The entire game industry is predicated on that. People don't play those games for intellectual stimulation, okay? It's like you press that, it's like, oh my God, the graphics on this are unbelievable. Yeah, well, it's the same pattern. It's just that if you do it with an arcade, people say you're normal. If you do it with light switches and flapping your hands, they say you have autism. So the take-home point, if you're going to act strange, do it appropriately. Okay. Homeostasis means uh, that typically, and this again can be something like stereotypy is the common thing. Homeostasis simply means that you're engaging the behavior because you're trying to either, um, you're trying to get to an optimal state of stimulation. So if there's too little stimulation in the environment, you body rock in order to generate some. If there's too much stimulation in the environment, you body rock to block it out. It's the same behavior, but basically you're trying to modulate stimulation. So it has a homeostasis type. Uh, motivation. The final one, biological reinforcement, has been used, uh, and there's some merit to it. I don't think it explains everything. Some merit to uh, explain why people would do the vicious kind of self-injuries that I just mentioned. The theory is this, that we apparently have evolved so that when you um, are, receive a painful stimulus, your body releases endogenous opiates into the bloodstream. Okay. Uh, obviously as a way of quelling the pain. And so the idea is, is that children have learned that actually they can get a high by smashing themselves enough. So what looks to you like, oh my God, why is a person inflicting pain? No, they're generating endogenous opiates. Not exog, exog just means you buy it on the street. Endog just means you generate it in your own body. Um, and so therefore that's called biological reinforcement. And in fact, people have tried to um, uh, quell self-injury by administering naltrexone, which is an opiate blocker. It's an opiate antagonist. The same thing you give to, say, drug addicts, <laughs> okay? It's the same idea that, okay, you have endogenous opiates that are a consequence of self-injury. Maybe if you gave naltrexone, it would block it so the self-injury wouldn't pay off anymore. People have experimented with that. There's some data that suggests for some people it may have an effect. So anyway, these are some, there are other that I don't have to go into today, but I just want to give you a flavor for the idea that even the most extreme, horrible-looking behavior that looks completely random, um, completely irrational, uh, actually has a purpose. Uh, and so therefore, to really understand human behavior, you have to be aware of the multiple functions that it can serve and therefore analyze it within that sort of perspective. There, there's one more I've heard from talking with people who, who um, have self-injurious behaviors. Yep. They talk about sometimes not being able to feel where their body is, and 
Right. Sometimes having trouble initiating movement too. So you couple those two together, and they're feeling all the things you said. You know, are true. They're feeling frustrated in this right. situation with the task demand. Somebody's in their face, making them even more stressed. Right. They're having trouble moving, and then all of a sudden, when they're finally able to move, it right. comes out, and they don't really know like what parts of them are moving. Right. It comes out in this way of lashing, reaching out toward another or toward self um, in a way that can be very hurtful. Because it's a combination of anger and frustration at that point, as well as trying to move. To, and so the location of the body part was the, how you um, started. Well, it, it seems to be that they sort of don't know where their limbs are, and they're having trouble right. controlling them and moving right. them at the same time. Too. Right. So, so it's, it's like sensory always, feedback. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's right. like sensory feedback, and, right. and hitting themselves certainly helps them to feel themselves, right. um, especially if they hit themselves hard enough to right. finally have a feeling there. Um, and hitting others is more, I think, you know, this person's... Yes, that's different, really right. ...causing my problems. <laughs> yes, that, that is different, but since you raised that, um, I want to point out something, uh, which is that a single behavior can have multiple motivations. So a person could headbang, potentially, for all of these reasons, okay? On the other hand, um, many different behaviors can have the same function. So that's why I said at the beginning that what is less important than why. Uh, so when people say, oh, what am I going to do with so-and-so's aggressive? And then the psychiatrist will say, well, we'll give them risperidone. That is imbecilic. Why would you think that a drug like that would address every single function, okay? It, it's ineffective. The sum data that risperidone might go for this one, the task avoidance. And you know why? It has nothing to do with risperidone. Risperidone has a sedative property. And when you're sedated, you don't give a crap if the environment is aversive. <laughs> okay? So, therefore, they've never done the experiment that I would have done. And I've raised this once to psychiatrists, but they, they don't listen. They have hearing problems or cognitive or whatever. But basically, um, I said, well, wouldn't an appropriate control be chloral hydrate? which has a real sedative property. And you, oh, no, that's ridiculous. Yeah, who will explain, ridiculous is not what you call an intellectual debate, explain why it's ridiculous. Couldn't. They didn't do the right control. If you get any drug that has a sedative, I'm predicting that you'll uh, pr produce some impact on aggressive behavior. Benadryl. Yes, Benadryl is exactly correct. And when you have a, a young, typical, out of control little boy like I had when he was small, <laughs> oh my God, is that a little cough or something? <laughs> We're going for a drive. Here we go. <laughs> oh, it's so sweet and yummy. Go ahead. You know, and then you know, you know, and so that's the end of aggression. But that's not a treatment. What you really want to do in the long run is teach the person alternatives to that behavior, <laughs> not to become dependent on drugs. Um, yes. All those things there, how much cognitive process needs to be involved with this? Do they think about all these, or is it a very... That's a good question. Um, I, I, a lot of motivation, of course, is you're not aware. So other, and that's for all of us, by the way, not yeah. just for people with autism. You do things, and you're not aware. And somebody shows you a videotape of yourself, and you think, oh, my God, do I really do that? You say, oh, I must do it for such and such reason. So you wouldn't have to be aware, but people who have Asperger's syndrome, for example, are much more articulate, much more aware, um, can actually potentially process and say, I'm going to do such and such on purpose. So um, I think that for the vast majority of problem behavior, I don't think that it's planful. I don't think that kids th sitting there, what can I do <laughs> to get rid of the teacher today? I don't think they're actually thinking that through. It's more like trial and error. It works, and then bing, they lock onto it, and then that becomes the, the routine, the pattern. So it could be, it could be either. There are, there are cognitive, particularly with higher functioning. Uh, so, okay, so what is our understanding? The question is, well, how would you actually um, um, identify the various functions that I just listed? There has to be a way, an algorithm for figuring out, you know, which one is it. Um, and basically, there are three things that you can do. One is direct observation. I'm sorry, one is interview. The second one is direct observation. The final one is what's called functional analysis, which is basically an experiment where you manipulate something. Interview, which I'll just show very quickly. Here's th these are real people, by the way, from uh, a book that I've published, and also there's several articles I've published on this empirically. When we're having break time, Jim is quiet and happy, but when I ask him to go back to work, he yells and he pushes me out of the way. 
When we're doing physical exercises, I never get through more than one or two sit-ups before Jim runs away. If I ask him to come back, he tries to kick me. After a while, it's not worth it for me to force him. When we start folding his laundry, I tell him we'll have a snack when we're done. He'll fold one shirt, ask for the snack. If I say we have to fold more, Jim will have a tantrum. When he gets really bad, it's easier to finish folding the laundry myself. Translation. I make a lot of demands. He punishes me for every demand I make with aggressive behavior. I just back off and do it for him. So he, now this is parental perception. So at the level of interview, what you're getting is people's perceptions as to the reason why people do things. That's, a, that's intriguing, but it's not at the level that we want it. We need something more definitive in order to proceed with treatments. So that gets us to the direct observation, where if a parent says, and this is a different kid, but it's the same idea. If a parent says in an interview, I think Gary, my son, basically goes ballistic during having to make his lunch because he doesn't want to make his lunch. He's this, it's task avoidance. So we say, really? Do you mind if we visit your house when he is making lunch? That's direct observation. And the question is, is it confirmatory? Is what the mother's perception of what's going on really what's going on? And so you go to the home, and there's Gary's been making a peanut butter sandwich for the past five minutes. His mother was standing nearby. She said, Gary, you need to clean up the mess you made. His response to that was he threw the silverware on the floor and bit himself. Then he screamed no, and he ran out of the kitchen. The mother reacted by jumping out of his way. Three minutes later, she cleaned up the mess herself. The basic idea there is it confirms what the mother's perception was. I believe my son is doing this because he wants to get out of his task avoidance. In which case, we've now gone from perception to correlation. We're correlating actual presence of demands with presence of violent behavior. Okay? The final step in this type of analysis, this type of approach of actually figuring out why people are doing things is called functional analysis, which is an experiment where you manipulate things. That's the essence of an experiment. You manipulate things intentionally. You don't just sit there passively observing correlations. You purposely change the environment. So here's uh, Bob, same thing. These are a number of aggressive responses, and these are in 15-minute periods. 15 minutes, okay? So here's Bob and he's cruising at around 120 acts of aggression in, in every 15 minutes. 120. So you don't want to be the teacher. <laughs> um, and then here, and the, okay, so that's demands. And so there I, uh, so, you know, so you're Bob, <laughs> and I say, do this, Bob, and you give me a shot, okay, and I back off. And then I try it again, you give me another shot, and I keep backing off. What I'm teaching you, keep punching me, and I'll keep backing off. And when you, when you do that, unintentionally, the teacher's not meaning to do that, then what happens is you get the aggression here starting off at about 65, and by the time the teacher's done, it's almost at 200 for 15 minutes. So the teacher, the parent, or whoever doesn't understand what they're doing. They're not aware of the effect they're having when they keep backing off and feeding into the behavior, thereby teaching the kid, you want to avoid a task, smash your head against the table, attack people, throw a tantrum, flip the table over, trash the room, you'll get what you want. Uh, when you don't give demands, look what happens to the aggressive behavior. <laughs> okay? There is none. Um, and so that's the final element in this. And you keep doing this for different types of motivation. And you can actually probe and discover, is it attention? Is it task avoidance? Is it social avoidance? Uh, is it homeostasis? Is it sensory? There's ways of setting up the environment to probe and so that's how you figure out why people do things. Uh, and then once you know why somebody is doing th something, then you can advance the treatment because you understand what's making them tick. Okay? So, um, oh, okay. I have a question. Yes. I mean, I, I've seen this kind of behavior everywhere. I mean, little kids, uh, they will yes. be surrounded by people. When Absolutely. When people, they start crying because they know somebody will... Absolutely. Right so it's, it's everywhere. And Yes. And, uh, and I have a brother in the auto, and, uh, Down syndrome. Yes. And Same. Whenever uh, I try to be tough on him, so he, yes. he, he you know, and people come in, he's, he's just not a normal boy. So why no. are you tough on him? Yeah. That, he doesn't understand. And how do I, you know, say it's, it's that, that's that's. I hear that all the time. Uh, so and so is not normal, and that's why they do something. That's not an explanation at all. These processes are universal. It has nothing to do with Down syndrome or autism or anything. They're universal. It's just the way in which it is expressed is unique to the syndrome. So most people don't bang their heads against walls, but they'll do something else. 
if they want to get out of a situation. And you should never um, accede to that sort of uh, statement where, oh, why are you doing it? You know, their behavior is basically random or it's part of the syndrome or something. It's not part of anything. It's learned. It's learned and things that are learned can be unlearned. So when he's doing something that he's not supposed to, uh, um, are you allowed to put force against it? Or how do I no, you wouldn't do force, no. <laughs> if you do force, then you'll get killed. <laughs> so you don't do that. Um, what you have to do is analyze the situation in terms of what the triggers are, and then you modify the triggers. I'm going to come to that. I haven't reached the treatment section, but you're anticipating it. That is correct. There are things you can do. You've got to remember, I'm not just doing this as an intellectual exercise. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's people coming to me, and they expect results. <laughs> and they get very upset when the results are not too good. Um, because there's often like blood and things involved. So basically, this is called the sad state of the field. Problem this is how the field deals with problem behavior at the moment. This is called psychiatry. Um, the first thing you do is you label the person. Oh, you have Asperger's, you're PDD, NOS, you have autistic disorder, you're all screwed. Okay? People like you don't belong with the rest of us. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to segregate you. Label. You can go to a special facility where nice people will take care of you, okay? They're not so nice in the special facilities. I've been all over the world. They're not nice at all, okay? It's usually low-paid, minimum-wage people. They're unhappy to be there. They're untrained. They're not nice, okay? What happens when you put people in a not-nice situation? All people, including those with autism, they start to act out. Oh my God, look at you. <laughs> You're acting out. It must be Down syndrome. It must be autism. It must be your condition. You know what we'll do? We'll give you medication. They never call it drugs, by the way. It's medication. We're going to medicate you. That's good for you. So, label segregate drug is the exact opposite of what I just described. This leads to nothing. Okay, well, what it, what it leads to is this. Okay? Your child is so well behaved, what are their names? Prozac, Zoloft, and Ritalin. And I like the eyes, that's very good. <laughs> I like those wide open. That's Don of the Living Dead Eyes. Um, so basically, um, that's what we're trying to avoid. Okay. Well, what we're up to now is the basic idea of behind all of this, which is where I led in you know, my opening comments, is that to make progress in this, we have to integrate three fields of knowledge, behavioral psychology, biomedical, and technology. And technology is the pivot because we can't do a lot of these things without the right technology. That's what's hampering the field at the moment. Okay, so I'm going to do conceptual. Good. Okay, yeah, no, I'm sorry. These are the six dimensions of integrative research. There's a conceptual, taxonomic, diagnostic, methodological, treatment, and outcome. These are six dimensions that I just want to walk through. And then right at the end, I have uh, proposals. <laughs> it's research proposal time. <laughs> Um, let's look at the first one, conceptual. This is what's, in a minute, you'll see what's called a four-term contingency. Here's the way people conceptualize problem behavior. A teacher or a parent or whoever says, let's do reading to the kid, okay? That triggers, on some days it triggers aggression, on other days the kid actually reads. And so people say, oh my God, it's the same situation, someday they read, someday they are aggressive, the behavior is clearly random, it must be centrally driven. That's how you know people are in a state of ignorance. As soon as they go for it's centrally, everything is centrally driven, so that doesn't explain anything. Or it's biological. Well, everything is biological, so that's a non-explanation. Um, basically, when you have a fixed environment but dramatically different behaviors, that's when people think it's random, it's psychotic, it's incomprehensible. Um, okay, what's missing these, it's called three term because there's a trigger, that's one, produces a response, that's two, and then there's a consequence. If you're aggressive, you get out of reading, that's task avoidance. If you read, your mother or teacher actually praises you, so that's another consequence, that's nice, okay? So what's the difference between those two situations? Right here, there's another set of variable called setting events. This environment right here in this room is fixed, okay? And you're all in a certain state of health, and so maybe you're attending to me right now. If tomorrow I come back, and give the same presentation, but four of you have severe migraine headaches, your behavior won't be the same. You'll look inattentive, distracted, whatever. 
And people will say, well, your behavior is random. No, it's that there was a fourth element called a setting event, which in this case is your health status, and we'll get to that in a minute. Basically then, th there's more than just the present environment. There's a broader context of the present environment. And by understanding that broader context, you're able to ma more precisely specify when problem behavior will or will not occur. And so, there, sorry, yes? And there's still a probability. On, on that, right? So, like, even if the setting is the exact same, the trigger is the exact same, there's still some probabilistic. Will not, will not. Yeah. Probabilistic, yeah. yeah. Right. But a clear difference in yes. probabilities, <laughs> yes. No, nothing, nothing, only Pavlovian conditioning is <laughs> X and Y, okay? Yeah. A reflex of involuntary, then you get it all the time. This is not like this. Um, here is what's happening. When the person is either in a state of pain or fatigue and you give them the reading task, that's when you get aggression. You know why? It's the same for all of us. If people are making demands on you and you are in pain or you are fatigued or you are anxious, okay, it's not the same as when you are experiencing no pain, no fatigue, no anxiety. The reason why is that when you're in these states, things that are mildly aversive become incredibly aversive. You know that. Just from, forget about autism. You, you have kids at home, and it's been a bad day at work, and you have splitting heading, the pits, kids nagging you, you know, <laughs> okay. And that, or you've had a tremendous day at work, and the kids nag you and say, oh, my kids, they're just such nags. <laughs> I love them. <laughs> well, it's obviously a different response to the same situation because there is a setting event out there, and it varied from day to day. And that, that is what account, is accounting for a big chunk of the variance of your behavior. So therefore, we need to analyze this. And this plus this is called the context for behavior. And so what I'm saying is that no matter what behavior you're looking at, it has a context and you have to analyze that broader context. So what does that mean practically? This is the four-term contingency and forget about all this stuff down here. It's down here is where I'm focusing on. Setting events, basically there's three different categories of setting events. Some of them are social setting events. And I'll give you examples. Some of them are activity setting events. And final class is called biological setting events. So the broader context for behavior could be social, activity routines, or biological. And by analyzing these three generic categories, which contain many exemplars, each one, you will get an opportunity to actually predict and understand behavior and use that information to actually develop treatments systematically. So what would that mean? Many contexts, many possibilities. That simply means, look at this, social context. Um, these are just examples. And by the way, I should lead up to something here. I believe that all these contexts that I'm talking about, I believe they eventually channel down all through a pathway into arousal. And hence the interest in the technology from my standpoint. So all of these things are certainly out there in, you know, in the external world. But I think they eventually, with the mediation, is that they cause arousal of various kinds. Uh, and that's what's mediating the effects on problem behavior tonight. Um, so let's look at the uh, first one here, just to give some examples. Uh, for exa uh, these are real data now coming up. Um, we, inter we basically interviewed maybe about 130 parents. We're just writing this up now. Um, when there is, the question is, what sort of social context would a parent, particularly a mother, endorse as being highly likely to produce severe outbursts of problem behavior? All those problem behaviors I described. Okay? You say to some mothers, what about if your family recently had a disagreement among family members or disagreement with peers? What would happen to your kid? A lot of mothers will say they're highly likely to explode. Uh, what about down here? Um, your child is frustrated because he or she has trouble communicating in certain circumstances. Mothers will say, highly likely. Um, denied access to what he or she wants. The kid is pointing. They want a videotape. They want something. Not now. Not now. Not now. What happens with not now? Right here. Denied access. 80% of mothers say that will lead with a high likelihood, high probability, that will lead to an explosive outburst of self-injury, aggression, tantrums, property destruction. 80% of mothers, okay? That's what they're saying. Um, and a communication, uh, about 50% or so of mothers uh, endorse that as highly likely to set off an explosive episode, um, and so on. There's many other, uh, many other categories. And by the way, 
down here where it says teasing, it's only 10%. That doesn't mean that teasing is not important. It's very important to the 10% of families that see teasing as a major uh, trigger for problem behavior. So therefore, and these things are not random. These are actually gleaned from the uh, literature, from the clinical literature, as things that large numbers of people have observed as, as context events for setting off problem behavior. Again, just reflect on this for a minute, which is a lot of these things, denied access, communication problems, frustration, that kind of thing. You can imagine how all of these things would actually produce states of arousal in people. It's not just, I'm denied access and now I respond like some kind of Pavlovian dog or something. That's not the way it works at all. Denied access causes me to become incredibly, quote, upset. That's the part that's not measured at the moment. Now, some other kids, you deny access, nothing happens. You know why? I believe that there's no arousal there. And so it's not, it's, so denied access could set off arousal, which in turn would mediate problem behavior. But if it doesn't, you won't get problem behavior, in which case it's not just denied access, it's denied access doing something that then mediates something else. Yes? Um, is, there, is there any sense of why the number of fathers is much lower there? Is that yeah, you know, in, in, uh, yeah, in a nutshell, fathers are clueless. <laughs> um, and the reason for that is fathers do not have the same exposure to the... We did that on purpose, by the way. Um, the, when we interview, when we want to know what makes children tick, unless it's a single father, <laughs> meaning they're raising the kids, we interview the mothers. We just did this to make sure, okay? What it is is fathers, you know, in the developmental psychology literature, mothers and fathers have different roles, particularly with young children. Mothers' roles are caregivers. Father's roles are playmates, <laughs> playmates. <laughs> and so that's what fathers do. They come in, oh, there's my little boy or girl. Yes, yeah, yeah, we're playing together. And we're, okay, goodbye. Mommy will take care of stuff now. Bye. <laughs> so mothers are the caregivers. Fathers are the playmates. So as a playmate, you don't see all the other stuff. <laughs> right. right? Mothers get to do things like make demands on the children. It's time for bedtime. It's time to put away your toys. It's time to eat dinner. It's time to come up and play. So mothers actually get to do all the things that trigger children off. And that's why mothers report, oh my God, the child's completely out of control. And you interview the father. How's your kid? They seem great. I love them. <laughs> we were playing the other day. It was such fun. Say, so, well, how about during bath time? I don't know. Ask her. <laughs> Yes, very astute. They're, they're not the same. I'm surprised by the first one. When we've tried to um, elicit frustration in yes. you know, typical participants for our studies just to um, have computers learn how people behave when they're frustrated. Yes. We always um, set up a goal and thwart access Absolutely. to the goal. It's, it's the Guaranteed. recipe for frustration. <laughs> Guaranteed. And, and that's, what, that's why I said that these things are universal. It's just that the way a typical kid would express their frustration is not by headbanging or... Uh, even violent tantrums, something. But they might squeeze the mouse. Oh, yes. Them. Oh, yeah. They'll you be know, angry. Avatar. They'll be angry, yes. Yeah. Angry in a civilized way. Um, all right, just to give you a little example, um, I said that relationships are a context, okay? Bad relationships, are, bad relationships are a context for bad behavior. When people say you have poor rapport with somebody, you have a poor relationship, it turns out it makes a difference. Um, and so, therefore, this is just an example here. Well, forget this. This is a, this is a report. We, we have multiple methods for determining whether or not two people have a good relationship. Um, and when you actually um, monitor that and characterize good versus bad relationship, there's a relationship between that uh, rapport and problem behavior. Look at this. This is Joan eating a meal, it's called. That's the task, eating a meal. So uh, somebody says to Joan, okay, Joan, it's time to eat dinner, why don't you get the plates and the silverware and get the food out of the refrigerator? It's a series of demands, okay? Now, these green bars, uh, this is time elapsed in minutes to uh, violent episodes of aggressive behavior and self-injury. <laughs> All right, time elapsed in minutes, okay? These green bars mean the person that asked Joan to do those things is a person that Joan hates. And the time elapsed in minutes before the, the per Joan explodes is actually mostly not minutes. It's usually like less than a minute, sometimes seconds. Um, so these green bars are bad. That means that the eating session was terminated due to violent behavior. These blue bars, these are control conditions over here. I'm not going to go into it. See what's it? So that's poor rapport and demands. This should say good rapport and demands. Now here's a different person 
who has an excellent relationship with Joan, giving the same demands as the green person gave, okay? And these blue bars mean successfully completed eating sessions with no problem behavior. And you can see what happened. There's an exception right there. But o overwhelmingly, um, it's a very pleasant mealtime. And so what it means is that one of the contexts for problem behavior is horrible relationships between people. Uh, and those are acquired over time. Usually when you have a long history of negative interactions with people, when they see you, they bolt. And if you say, don't bolt, you have to stay here with me, then they punch. So this is just by way of illustrating that there are data behind what I'm saying. We published this a couple of years ago. Uh, and then this next one is just a replication across individuals. This is Steve and this is John. And it's the same pattern. Lots of green, uh, I'm sorry, when, when it's, uh, uh, th these are poor, yeah, LR means poor rapport and demands. Same pattern, lots of problem behavior, awful. Over here, good rapport and demands, same task, hardly any problem behavior, and the task is fine. So, uh, no, the, the green, I'm sorry, the green means bad things happen and the session was terminated. Like violent episodes happen, the session had to be terminated. Blue means nothing bad happened and the session was com successfully completed. Whatever the task was, was ac actually, whether it was vacuuming <laughs> the floor or this person had a job, it was completed successfully with no problem behavior. So blue is good, green is bad. And the longer the session is better? No, it depends on the nature of the task. If a meal takes only 10 minutes, and after 10 minutes, there's no problem behavior, that's fine. If it's a delivery job and it takes two hours, then it has to last two hours, otherwise it's not so fine. So, yeah, it varies. But I guess it helps yes. you see that it's not just that had they gone longer on these oh, months, no. um, there, mm. would have, there would have been an inevitable SIV. Instead, mm. we see they could go as long as 40 minutes there. The, still this is correct, and that's why we picked those tasks on purpose. We wanted to show that it, it's not, a it's not a function of time because you're quite right. For some people, it could be they don't want to do it anymore. So there was a question. Yeah, um, from our previous lecture last week, there was um, a real conversation about how to analyze statistics. And do you think there's a danger just looking at, say, three examples and seeing a real clear difference in three examples? Well, there, there's a danger of doing that if you want to generalize and say, because of these three, it therefore is true for everybody. Mm -hmm. You can't do that. Um, but there's a concept in the literature, we're going to come to this actually because this is a question of research design now. Um, um, there's a question of, well, how would you establish generality within a single subject design approach? And the answer is that there's actually three ways. Uh, there's a thing called direct replication, systematic replication, and operational replication. Sy direct replication means I, if you're the subject and you're 23 years old and you have autistic disorder and you're aggressive and I successfully treat you, then direct replication will mean I will get 20 other people who are your age with your diagnosis and your problem behavior. That's direct because it's exactly the same. Systematic replication will mean I will purposely pick other people who have different ages, different genders, a wide variety of diagnoses and a wide variety of problem behaviors, do the same treatment and by gosh, I get the same effects. So therefore, it must be, quote, more general. Okay? The third kind, operational uh, replication, is the most important at all, which is up until now, I keep referring to myself as having done the study. The best thing that can happen is a scientist somewhere else in the United States who doesn't even particularly like you yeah. and doesn't trust you does it and gets the same results. That's called operational replication. So between direct, systematic, and operational, the more you do of that, then the more closely it approximates or, or addresses the issue of external validity or general, uh, generality. Um, but very important now, the heterogeneity of autism is so great that if you try to do group statistical designs, which is you know, considered uh, by, in some quarters as the gold standard, what you're doing is averaging apples and oranges. And in research design, when you average apples and oranges, do you know what you get? Lemons. So basically, activity and routine context, um, we'll, okay, we'll do this and then we're going to have a, a, a short break because it's 11, right? Um, activity and routine, okay, this means there's a series of contexts that have certain qualities or properties that regularly 
set off problem behavior. And uh, real good examples of these um, uh, are the first one, which is a preferred activity ends. Okay, Susie, come in off of the playground. It's time to do deadly boring schoolwork. Okay, that's a bad one. Okay, Billy, put away all your toys. It's bedtime. <laughs> I don't want to put away my toys. No, you have to, because it's bedtime. Mommy wants you to go to bed. I'm not putting away my toys. Okay, fine. With regular kids, typical kids, you can reason, sort of, um, and you know, have some impact. Somebody's Even not, typical kids like to be given will a 10-minute warning. A, a, ten, a big warning, right? but then they'll negotiate. How about one more minute? <laughs> okay. And if you're not communicating, you don't negotiate. Uh, you go for it. Okay, and so that'll take care of the preferred activity ending. Um, and uh, here's, a, um, here's another one that actually we purposely put in there, which is medical appointments. These are deadly for people with autism uh, because they don't like um, unpredictability, and medical appointments are full of, that, full of that. They don't like, keep in mind, if I say to you, you're a communicator, if I say to you, okay, I, I'm going to give you a little injection, you just feel a little pinch it. You don't know what that means. Okay, all of a sudden somebody stabs you in the arm. <laughs> That's the end of that. Um, and the worst, by the way, is dentistry. Because then what the kid does, and I have seen this, they grab the drill. And it's actually, I've seen this. And the drill, and those are high speed drills. It goes right into your cheek, and then it has to be sutured. And so, therefore, basically, <coughs> these are issues. Okay, so that's why we have medical appointments. And one experience like that, you get what's called traumatic avoidance conditioning, is the technical term. One experience like that, and you will never go to a dentist again voluntarily, and you have like armed guards accompanying the kid. And actually, what happens is they put kids under general anesthesia for the simplest thing. Somebody's going in for a simple you know, exploration of the teeth, general anesthesia. Somebody's going in for a regular medical exam, they have to be sedated. Um, it's really, and it's an unwise thing because general anesthesia has some very negative sequelae, including death, uh, depending on the individual. So, and, and, um, yeah, one of the guys who, who funds our work said every time his son goes to the dentist, it's $25,000 of expenses yeah. and general yeah. anesthesia. And right. Well, yeah. they do it in the emergency. They do it in the yeah. uh, surgical ward of the hospital. They don't do it in a dental office. Yeah. I, another thing, too, that's triggering there is the sounds in those environments are extremely no um, overloading, sensory, and stressful. If you're hypersensitive to sound, right. you know what that high speed drill sounds like. And you can see many children with autism do this. This is how, I'll, I'll, by the way, how you know when some people have autism. They, they are walking around like this. When you see that, that's a very autistic feature. Um, and somebody like that will not respond well to a high-speed drill sound uh, and lots of other obnoxious sounds. So uh, let me just wrap this up and then we'll, because uh, it's a little section, we'll just put the, okay. So these are, these are actually data, again, from mothers, activities, and you see what's happening. Preferred activity ends, 70% of mothers say, that is highly likely to set off severe problem behavior. Uh, just for fun, here's medical appointments, 30% uh, of the mothers. The problem is, is that when you can't complete a medical appointment, you can't make a medical diagnosis. And as we'll see after the break, children with autism have high rates of medical issues that are undiagnosed. And those medical undiagnosed things generate pain and discomfort. Pain and discomfort is a biological setting event for severe problem behavior. And therefore, they look like they're randomly exploding. But in fact, it's undiagnosed pain and discomfort. So one of the things that we did is, uh, I'll just show you and then we'll stop, is we, uh, th these are the baseline for Cheryl. This is percent steps completed of a medical procedure. And the answer is 20% before she smashed the doctor. That was the end of that. Uh, and then the same thing with Joe. There's Cindy. She got zero. And she didn't, she didn't make it at all into even one step into the exam. This, by the way, shows that we successfully treated. I'm not going to go into that today. We actually have treated all those things I've been talking about, we have treated successfully. So the assessment that we did, the analysis we did, led logically to a series of treatment steps that we had positive outcomes. So that's why it's very important to do this. Um, okay, so now we're going to have a brief break, and then we're going to go into biological, effective, cognitive. Uh, and then I'm going to rush through that because I wanted to get to the research proposal part. I'm going to focus on a few side effects of medication, oddly enough. Now, here's a, here's a paradox, all right? There's a category of drugs called psychotropics, 
Psychotropics are drugs that are given to control problem behavior, like risperidone is an example, or Abilify, all right? The odd thing about this, the odd thing about this is that drugs produce side effects. Some of those side effects are biological setting events for problem behavior. The drug you are giving for problem behavior has side effects that set off problem behavior. That's why people say, uh, oh, doctor, my kid's gotten a lot worse since you put them on the drug that was supposed to make them better. Okay? Now, it's complex. There's a drug environment interaction which the psychiatry doesn't... And by the way, I want to be very clear about this. I love the general field of medicine. There's just one portion I don't care for. <laughs> okay, so Martha and I are very close. <laughs> we like each other a lot. <laughs> so that works. <laughs> Um, okay, so side effects of medication, okay, illness or pain is lethal. And that, as I mentioned earlier, large numbers of people with disabilities, including autism, have all sorts of um, medical conditions. Um, and these actually set off or are context for problem behavior. I'm going to just jump down right here to the bottom. See this where it says feeling frightened, worried, anxious, or agitated? I'm going to actually skip right to the uh, data slide just to make my point. Look what mothers nominate as the most common thing to set off problem behavior uh, in this category. Fear, anxiety. And fear and anxiety is the least researched in the literature. And I thought about that. Why should the thing that's most important be the least researched? And the answer is no technology. When you're looking at somebody, it's very hard, particularly if they have autism, they don't give off the usual cues. I can tell when most of you are anxious. But people with autism have idiosyncratic ways of expressing themselves. And so therefore, within, and I'm going to get to this later, within a child, you'll see consistent representations of anxiety, albeit in an idiosyncratic way. But across children, you will not see similarities. In the general population, you will. You know, if you see, how do you think, if you scare somebody, you see a startle, you say, you know, boo, they'll, <gasps> okay? You do that to somebody with autism, they could become echolalic. Meaning, uh, they'll say something like, you know, uh, don't put the brass monkey in the drawer. <laughs> and you'll say, what? And the reason why is like eight years ago, somebody had this brass monkey and they put it in the drawer and they scared the kid. And, and somebody said to the kid, oh, I won't put the brass monkey in the drawer anymore, Billy, because it scared you. And he memorizes that. And then in the future, when he's scared, instead of doing what I just did, which is what everybody who you know, doesn't have autism, which is you know, <gasps> that kind of thing, he says, don't put the brass monkey in the door. Now, people look at that and they say, I don't know what the hell that was. It's nonsense. So you can build up. A kind of a fear, like in PTSD, where there's an association that's yes. in, um, in a state of fear. Yes. Uh, and later, it comes up involuntarily. Involuntarily, in an idiosyncratic way. And so 20 different kids could have their own idiosyncratic way. And the other thing in terms of facial expression would be different too. I'm going to get to that later. Mm -hmm. The facial expression, the body language could all be different. Idiosyncratic but stable and consistent within a kid. Hence the necessity for N equal 1 design and hence for the necessity for a technology that monitors individuals and not group averages. We don't care about group averages. Um, okay. So anyway, there, there you see frightened. More than 50% of the mothers saying, if my child's frightened, anxious, there's an extremely high likelihood that they're going to lose it in a major way. That's what that is. Okay? Um, and then the others we don't have to dwell on. Uh, and then this is just a, an example, a data example, uh, with pain, which by the way is another source of arousal. Keep in mind what I'm saying is that all those different categories I think have a final common pathway into arousal. All right? That's what's happening. That's the mediator. Um, and so this is uh, actually a, a touchy one. This is actually menstrual pain. Um, and when, before we published this, I asked a friend of mine who's a radical feminist, I said, I'm concerned about something. People are going to say, are you saying that women go psychotic? Is that what you're going to say? <laughs> and I'm saying, I'm, I was worried about that. She says, no, no, Ted, here's what, what you have to say. You just say, it's just an example of the general category of pain. Okay, so everybody, this is just an example of the general category of pain. I'm not really talking about menses. Got it? Okay. So the apology part is over. All right. So basically then, uh, what you see is here is Judy, okay, with autism. And menses actually refers to menstrual pain and discomfort. 
uh, you know, low back pain, abdominal pain, nausea, that kind of thing. Okay? Serious. All right. Um, Non-menses means no pain or discomfort. And we have scales, but I don't like them. I mean, we use them and we're successful in the study, but I would like something more physiologically based. That's what I want. Um, anyway, B means no uh, demands. I make demands on her. We make demands on her. And A means no demands. So what this is is the four-term contingency. I'm presenting demands or I'm not presenting demands. And I'm laying it on top of you're in pain, you're not in pain. And notice where the spikes are. If the person's not in pain, it doesn't matter if you give them demands or no demands, they don't care less. There's no aggression. Over here, where it says menses, A means you leave them alone. You're in pain, I know you're in pain, I'm leaving you alone. B is I know you're in pain, I'm going to make a lot of demands on you. You get these huge spikes. Okay? It's very lawful. So the intersection between the trigger, which is I'm making demands on you, and your physiological state, you are in pain, no good. Every other state doesn't matter. So it's a confluence of events, a multifactorial, uh, which all these things are, by the way. Um, and so that's a demonstration of how pain can actually generate severe outbursts of problem behavior. And then this next one is just a replication across four women. It's the same thing. You notice it's a single subject design. No, this is an N of one, each one. And the name given to this is a reversal design. I don't know if Matthew has gotten to research methodology, but there's names for these things. Um, we don't have to go into the, we don't have to go into uh, the details of this except to say this: single subject design is robust with respect to internal validity. In other words, you, it, it, you, it allows you to make causal statements: X causes Y. It's weak with respect to external validity, meaning you can't now generalize from this to all women because it's not a randomized clinical trial. The problem is, is that to run randomized clinical trials in autism is almost meaningless because there's such heterogeneity that the possibility you're going to constitute homogenous groups that are comparable is almost zero. And that's why you get so much noise in the literature, uninterpretable data. All right, so I just wanted to illustrate that quickly. And then this is just um, uh, a thing to make it more general, which is across a variety of medical conditions. We looked at many, many people. They had all sorts of different medical conditions. And we noticed this. On sick days, uh, they had motor pain behavior. And uh, I just want to illustrate, okay, the difference between, now this is facial recognition now, okay? Here's how you can do it, but it's, uh, it's to my mind, it's not adequate because it's, I want a physiological measure. I want an arousal measure, like what's happening here on, on Raza's computer. That's what I want to see, <laughs> OK? Um, it looks like this. There is a difference between pain and anxiety. If you are in a state of pain, abrupt pain, it looks like this. If you are in a state of anxiety, it looks like this. <sighs> you can recognize those two, OK, in you and I. People with autism, it's idiosyncratic, <laughs> okay? Now, some, there, there are some, and others, some features you can see, and that's why we're able to do this study. You can see some features, but there's a lot of idiosyncratic mannerisms and body language that's unique to each individual, which is why I got the idea that we need to do N of 1 studies with physiological arousal, not these more global things that vary too much from kid to kid. Anyway, so you have on sick days lots of motor pain behavior, on well days hardly any. On sick days, lots of ver vocal pain behavior, moaning and groaning, and th uh, my tummy hurts. And, all, okay. and then on well days, of course, you wouldn't. Okay, that makes sense, but that's not the real day. The real date is the next slide. On sick days, you have a uh, much higher level of, in terms of frequency and intensity of problem behavior than on well days. That's a significant relationship, which means that if you're unaware that a person has a medical condition, their behavior will look random. You'll say, why is this person exploding randomly? And then, you know, two years later, you'll discover, oh my God, they had migraines. I didn't know that. Now, migraines don't follow the clock. They're random, which means that when they happen, the behavior will be random looking. But it's not random if you have this perspective of context and you're tracking it. But the thing is, that you can have a migraine, but you don't know the level of pain. You can have a medical condition, but the pain associated with that can fluctuate over time. Pain is not constant, okay? The only way in which you would be able to track that is with a physiological measure of arousal. 
So if somebody said, like, I have GERD, I, I literally have GERD, okay? It's not just an example, I do. So I'm a big expert on gastrointestinal. Um, and it's like uh, sometimes, it's under control because I have medication, but um, basically sometimes it's horrible and sometimes it's nothing, but it's the same condition. So unless somebody's monitoring me with something like that, physiologically, I won't know. So my behavior won't make any sense and the medical diagnostic will look like it's not terribly related to problem behavior, but it will be if I have arousal measures. Like, oh my God, he's going into GERD. <laughs> you know, it's spiking. And of course, there'd be other cues, uh, you know, where people would, uh, for example, with reflux, will massage the epigastric area here. People do things like that, or their throat, you know, do that. And when you see that combined with spiking of arousal, you think, I wonder if they're having a GERD episode. If so, problem behavior is not far behind. That's a tremendous advantage clinically. That means a lot. And right now, the field is totally primitive because the technology is absent. And so therefore, we have to resort to more indirect measures. OK, uh, I'm not going to even do fatigue because I want to I move on. It's the same thing. Fatigue, the same thing. OK. <laughs> uh, taxonomic. Uh, what this is, and I'm going to run through this because I want to get to the end of these research ideas, okay? What I'm saying is that particularly in the area of biological events, but also the social and activity events, they generate a lot of these other things. So, for example, certainly medical will generate, this is basically many, there are many biologically based setting events. That's all I'm saying with this slide. And so one can develop a taxonomy of these and say we need to track these. We need to track them in terms of physiological measure, in terms of behavioral measure, uh, because there's lots of them, and each of them has different implications for understanding behavior and for treating it. And so pain and discomfort is one category. Fatigue, drowsiness, reduced alertness is another. Irritability, hypersensitivity, for example, the auditory or tactile stimuli. A lot of the children are hypersensitive to auditory. Others are tactically defensive. You try to touch them, they go berserk. The most famous person with autism in the world is Temple Grandin, who I'm sure that Matthew has mentioned. And I heard her uh, talk. She was getting an award at ASA the, the year that I was, I, I gave a major talk there. And she was at an award, and I still remember. <laughs> she was getting an award, and she does have autism. And she's super high functioning. Got an award. She said, yes, I'd like to thank you for this award. Um, you need to do more research on sensory problems. My clothes are driving me crazy right in the middle of her award. <laughs> I, was like, I said, what the hell was that? And I, there was a friend next to me who actually went to graduate school with her and said, she has sensory problems. <laughs> and the field as a whole does not address this. So she's very angry because she can't take. And then I had dinner, oddly enough, with her mother that night. And her mother said to me, I, was, I said, well, that was uh, interesting what your daughter said. And uh, the mother said, you know, it was only a year ago that I, she finally let me hug her. Now she's in her 40s. She says, before that, if I touched her, she went ballistic. So that's a category. Hypersensitivity is a category of biological setting events. It's, it's um, easy to underestimate how irritating that can be to a talk with another person who yes. has exactly the same report as Temple um, and said later she realized, she thought everybody walked around feeling like they had a degree nine sunburn the whole time. Right. Like nine on, on a pain scale. Yes. And she said right. she had a nine for most of her life. Right. Didn't abate till in right. her 20s. Now can you imagine if I don't know that about you and I'm trying to teach you or interact with you or whatever, what that would do? Uh, if I'm bothering you and you're feeling like that, the likelihood that you'll lose it. It's, it's also, well, I don't want to do too yep. really too much, but yep. just connected to the um, similarities of people who have PTSD and later get a, you know, have autism-like behaviors. So it just makes me wonder how much of this undiagnosed pain and you know, um, heightened arousal or whatever else it's, it's causing. Um, is a major issue. Yeah, our present. Yeah. yeah, there's no question it's a major issue. Um, uh, anxiety is another problem. A large number of those social events that I listed, a large number of those activity events, and even the biological events. You've got to remember, when I said pain versus anxiety, one thing that pain can do is generate anxiety. So these things are sort of become conflated after a while, um, etc. So anyway, that's just to show you that there are a large thing, a number of categories that we could actually monitor and interpret, and these would lead actually to different kinds of treatments. Um, Diagnostic, I'm not going to cover uh, except to just give you some indication. Um, 
One of the things, of course, that doctors can't do with people with autism is interview them and say, where does it hurt and describe the pain, okay? We actually have a study starting up now that we're going to teach people to, to point to where they hurt. The other thing, though, that's much more challenging and much more interesting conceptually is this. Have you noticed, like, if you ask a three-year-old, if a doctor asks a three-year-old, no pediatrician in the right mind would do this, say, okay, Billy, okay, so it hurt, your, your, your tummy hurts. Is it a sharp pain? Is it a stabbing pain? Is it throbbing? Is it aching? A three-year-old won't answer that. A five-year-old won't answer that. But later in life, we can all answer that. How could that be? Okay, how could that be? Who teach? You don't go to school and people instruct you. Here is how you describe your internal states, boys and girls. Nobody does that. What happens, and this is going to be how we, we are going to teach it, is this. You're a very little kid. When I was little, I used to, like most boys, be very active, and I'd fall and I'd scrape my knee. And when I was little, there was a thing called iodine, uh, which is about 90% alcohol. Uh, and my mother would put it on my knee, and I would go through the roof when I was very, very little. And she would say, oh, I'm sorry, does that sting? Does that sting? Does that sting? Does it? 9,000 times, okay. And then, you know, a week later, I'd fall and do it in my elbow, more iodine. Oh, does it sting? Does it sting? Does it sting? Okay, here's what's happening, okay. Here's how you acquire internal state labels. You have this general arousal, which doesn't mean anything. It's just general arousal because you just wounded yourself. There's also subjective phenomenological experience. That combination, general arousal, subjective um, phenomenological experience, your mother labels for you. Okay, it's like she's saying, okay, you know the arousal you're experiencing and the accompanying subjective phenomenological experience? We call that sting. Got it? So mommy's going to repeat it 9,000 times as you injure various body parts. Later in life, with no further training, you're in the ophthalmologist's office and he puts those eye drops in to dilate your pupils so they can see the, uh, you know, the retina in the back. And then you wince and the doctor says, are you all right? And you say, with no training, it stings. Where did that come from? It generalized from the, uh, that subjective arousal plus the, that's a phenomenological aspect, plus, yeah, the phenomenological aspect is a subjective feeling, and then the arousal. That has been taught to you earlier as that's called sting. So later in life when you encounter that again for the first time in the ophthalmologist's office, you say, gee, that arousal plus the subjective phenomenology my mom taught me is called sting. And that's why we all have the same label. Yes? So I think for stinging, you sort of actually in some ways have a different case than you do for other phenomena. So for things that are like throbbing pains versus sharp pains, it may be harder to identify what kind of outside stimuli would actually induce that so you can label it for Correct. Else. That's exactly what happened. Like, for example, aching and gnawing. How would that be? Okay. Aching and gnawing is this. When, when you have GERD symptoms or something like that, epigastric pain, and you're doing this, and your mother looks and she says, oh, you know, or a doctor, you know, you're looking and you say, so is that like an aching feeling? <laughs> okay, They're te because otherwise you have no way. How would, how would you ever come up with that word? Who, how would you come up with that? Oh, wait a minute, this must be called aching. How, no, somebody is talking. Look, when you're doing this, and you're burping, okay, and there's acid, okay, you know what that is? That is called gnawing. That's a gnawing, aching feeling, okay? So therefore, your arousal plus that phenomenology, that, that label we give it, is gnawing. So what they're doing is they're, they're looking at your behavior, the external cues, uh, and seeing where you're rubbing and other physical symptoms, and they're saying, okay, that's GERD, that's an aching gnawing. Okay, all people with GERD will be told, when you do that, that's aching gnawing. Um, now later, of course, if you do this, this is called, I don't want to get into the tech, technical stuff, but when you do that for multiple um, examples of what I just described, it's called multiple exemplar training. When you do it for multiple examples, it generalizes to new cases. So if later in life you hurt your muscle in your leg and it has an aching, gnawing feeling, I mean, I'm, I'm only, I'm, I'm making this case because it, it seems like this is one of the classical problems in autism, that you actually, the people end up systemizing everything because actually generalizing to new examples is a specific issue with autism. It is a specific issue, and there's a technology for overcoming it. And it's called, you have to train multiple examples of the same phenomenon. And so that's why it is later in life when your leg aches and gnaws for some other reason. You say, wait a minute, that arousal plus the subjective feeling I'm having I used to have it here, where it was called aching and gnawing. It's now down here. Oh, doctor, I think my leg has this, or usually it's in the joints, actually. My joints have aching and gnawing. Mm -hmm. You don't say, I have GERD in my knee. You say, uh, it's aching and gnawing. So, anyway, so that's where I think it comes from. Mm -hmm. 
Actually, that's not my idea. It was Skinner that actually came up with that, although he did it in the, in the context of uh, learning emotion labels. So you have a state of arousal and it's a birthday party. Your mother says, you must be happy. <laughs> and then in the future, it's like, oh, um, it's, this is like uh, everybody's laughing and smiling, and I'm aroused. That's called, ha I am happy. So we all agree everybody's happy. Of course, you don't know inside what you really are. Okay, so fine. So that's all I want to go for that. Um, and um, we're coming to the end of this just overview. I've already um, told you a, a little bit about why I think n equals 1 designs are very, very important here. Uh, they're extremely important when you're trying to, say, make judgments of why people are aroused. And I'm going to come to that in a second. Um, because of the idiosyncratic facial expressions, the idiosyncratic body mannerisms. Again, the general theme is consistent within a child, varied across children. So therefore, don't do a group design and average. I see that all the time. The worst study that you could do is, children with autism on average have such and such level of arousal. means nothing. That's completely useless clinically. You can't do anything with that. You'd want to know what a particular kid's arousal profiles are, and that's what I'm going to end with in, in, in a few seconds. Okay, so that was taxonomic, diagnostic, um, and methodological, and I'm, I'm not actually going to, the, we're, we're up to treatment. I just, that's all I want to impress upon you with the treatment idea is that the reason why we spend so much time analyzing and understanding is that if you have the right analysis and the right understanding, it leads logically to treatments. That's all I'm saying. So that's the real reason for spending so much time on the analysis part. If the analysis stops and there's no treatments to come from it, people say, well, that was intellectually interesting but practically useless. So we don't want that. So basically, um, problem context lead to problem behavior. So therefore, what you need to do is something about the problem context. So look at um, pain and discomfort. So with the women who had uh, menstrual pain, obviously, we provided ancillary medical treatment. Anaprox was the drug that was used. And that does something, but it doesn't do enough. And so therefore, there was residual pain and discomfort. And so there are procedures. Once you know something is pain-related, you think, what sort of pain-related procedures can I use as opposed to if they were anxiety? Then you'd say, oh, what kind of anxiety reduction? Those are two different things. Pain reduction and anxiety reduction are different. So that's why you need to know what the source of the arousal is so that you can rationally deduce treatments in a prescriptive manner. Uh, and so therefore, when you're in a pain or discomfort, what do you do? Well, whatever you do, we do with them, with people with autism. Uh, and so, for example, uh, provide choices. When you're not feeling well, you say, you know something, I don't feel well today. I, I will choose to do this, but not this. You, all of us, make those choices. We're allowed to because we don't have a disability. If you have a disability, people say, today you're doing this, no choice. Well, that's the kiss of death. If a kid is feeling horrible and you're forcing them to do things, they'll explode. You give them choices, they'll pick the thing that's least aversive to them, and therefore they won't explode. Uh, same thing, redistribute demands. You say things like, I'm sick right now. I can't get to it. If I feel better later, then I will do it. That's what people do when you're not feeling well, right? I'm too, can you come? I'm not, I can't come to the meeting today. I can't do this. I'll do it later when I'm feeling better. You redistribute demands. We allow them to do that. Uh, and then functional communication training means we teach them to say, I feel lousy. And that triggers appropriate support from other people. See? And so basically, it's a package, but the thing that's special is not these individual elements. No, the thing that's special, the take-home point is this. By analyzing the source of the arousal, you can logically deduce a series of reasonable things to treat. And that's why the assessment is important. And that's the main reason why the assessment is important from a practical standpoint. I missed what was embedding the Oh, that, I, I wasn't covering those, but basically what it means is this, is that what you do is um, some tasks are hard for you and some tasks are easy. The easy tasks are no problem. Even if you're not feeling well, they're easy, so you don't care. So what you do is when a person is not feeling well, what you do is you give them lots of easy tasks and occasionally embed a difficult one. Mm -hmm. And that's different than giving them all difficult ones or giving them a ratio of difficulty easy that's too high, meaning 50-50. It's better to do 20 difficult embedded in 80 easy, see? So that's called embedding or momentum. Uh, but again, again, to be clear, 
there are many, many treatments that are available in the literature, but which ones you pick would be guided by your analysis of the source of the arousal. That's how you're effective. And I'm not going to go to the next one. It's fatigue. It's the same general idea. Um, when you do everything that I just said, okay, there's several outcomes. One outcome is behavior changes, meaning less aggression, less SIB, less stereotypy, more social interaction, more communication. That's what happens. Another thing that happens is cognitive in nature, which is uh, more skill acquisition. When a person doesn't have these barriers, they're able to learn more. Uh, you try learning if you have a migraine, or you try learning if you're in a state of high anxiety. You can't. Actually, in psychology, it's called yerkes dotson law, which is that there's a, a bell-shaped curve. Too much anxiety or too little anxiety, um, you don't learn. There's an optimal level of anxiety for learning. <laughs> um, affect, um, when you do this, the people appear happier. And there's measures of subjective well-being from positive psychology literature that you can use to document that. And then finally, with all these things gone now, p families can actually do things with their children they couldn't do before. They can go back in the community, they go to restaurants and movie theaters and miniature golf and vacations and all the other things. And the summary that's given to this change in their life is called quality of life. So it starts off as abysmal, and that is the baseline. It's abysmal, and then it goes up to pretty decent. Okay, so that's, so basically then those are references that you already have, and the real point of all this is this. I didn't write this, this was Proust, the French writer Proust, that all the things I've described already exist in the literature. The, the elements are out there. There is such a thing as biomedical science, there's such a thing as behavioral psychology, there's such a thing as technology, but they're all disconnected. So the real voyage of discovery is not looking for these new landscapes, they're already there, but it's looking for the connection among them. Okay? In other words, seeing what we already have with new eyes, interrelating it. Um, and so that's essentially the guts of what I have to say. Now, what I'd like to do in the remaining time um, is basically present something where I think um, what I'd like to do is reconfigure everything that I just said on this uh, blackboard, on this uh, something or other board. <laughs> okay? So we don't have to actually... Uh, well, actually, you... Pr Oh, you've Should tilted it already? Oh, what's that? There we go. Oh, okay. So basically... Is there still a whiteboard behind that? There oh, you're be kidding. Oh, you mean a big one? Um, I, I saw yeah. Oh, oh, boy, that's yeah, even better. Oh, this okay. is really good. Go figure. Oh, terrific. Okay, so this um, this will be uh, much easier. Um, So, all right, so where we are is uh, that I've said that I believe that all those social um, contexts, all those activity and routine contexts, all those biological contexts, I think are feeding into a common thing called arousal. Um, and so what I can envision is, oh, will you be able to see this? Because oh, the well, board is messy. lights on the board that we can switch on. Um, oh, look yeah, at this. Good. Oh, okay, look at, okay. It's messy, though. Um, Okay, th this, is, this is arousal level, okay? So the ordinate is arousal level. And obviously that's high, and this is time. Um, and um, I don't know if you can see it. It's a little bit, it's a little bit messy here. Um, will this? Oh, okay. Yeah, may, yeah. All right, maybe something that'll stand out. Thanks. Okay. Nah, well, it, it'll be okay. We'll, we'll do it this way. Um, okay, so basically, um, what you have is arousal, and here, imagine this, you're, just like I'm hooked up, or probably something even more sophisticated than this, it's arousal level, and you're looking at a particular individual, and you'll get some pattern that looks like this, okay, and you get some pattern that looks like this, okay, but that's arousal, right? Here's what I'm suggesting, okay? Um, I'm going to put, I'll explain what these symbols mean, there's an X, there's a check mark, there's a little circle, here's another X, here's another check mark, here's a circle, here's another X, a check mark, a circle, okay. Okay, the first, these are arousal, okay. First question, what is worth measuring? What is worth measuring in order to take everything I just said and putting in a single model? Okay, I think there are four things that are worth measuring. Um, th that X 
is the context. So all those variables that I talked about, you know, the social variables and activity variables and all that other, and some of the, and some of the other variables, okay? That's a context. And so what I'm saying is, is that, first of all, the person encounters a context, and that begins to set off arousal. All right? Okay. Then what happens after that? There's this, there's this, okay, so there's, okay, oh, I'm sorry. This little squiggly thing, that's called arousal. Okay, that's the, that's the graph itself. That's arousal, okay. Um, so that's the second thing that's worth measuring. The first thing is context. Then the next thing is that it starts to do this. That's the arousal. And then that check mark uh, is called precursor behavior, and I'm going to explain that. Precursor behavior is this. When you set somebody off, okay, so I'm going to give you an example. Uh, suppose it is... Uh, Suppose it is, um, should I use anxiety or not? Um, yes, let's, it's an anxiety context. Remember, not anxiety, it's an anxiety context. An anxiety context would be something like you change the person's routines. People with autism like routines. So that means breakfast means I always have oranges, followed by Cheerios, followed by toast. One morning the mother says, okay. Okay, surprise, we're having grape juice, Count Chocula, and a bagel. No. No, no, we're, ha no, we're having, that's what we're having. It's a special surprise, surprise. <laughs> no more routine. The kid, <sighs> hyper, <laughs> you know. <sighs> okay, uh, that anxiety context, which is the X, is starting to produce arousal. Okay, and then uh, actually, um, Precursor behaviors I just demonstrated, by the way. <laughs> the arousal is a physiological measure. This stuff with the hyperventilating and twisting your hair <laughs> and making facial expressions, those are precursor behaviors. When you see those, a meltdown is imminent. That's a red flag. Uh, and those, those circles, that circle is problem behavior. That's the meltdown. That's problem behavior. All right? So what you would want to do is you would want to measure four variables. You would want to measure... Uh, context, um, arousal, precursor, and problem behavior. And why would you want to do that? Well, because this, okay, well, first of all, how would you do that? Now, that's a technology question that I can't answer. So that's you. Okay, here's the way I think. You would need to actually have two pieces of equipment. One is that you would have to have a physiological monitor like I'm wearing, and the other one is you'd have to have a visual monitor such as some kind of camera, but it'd have to be very sophisticated because here's the deal. What I really want to happen is the, uh, as this arousal starts to peak, if it's too standard, I made this up because that's for you, Matthew. Um, Matthew's in that machine. Um, <laughs> Uh, when it goes, say, two standard deviations above the baseline, I want something to trigger and ask two questions. Wait a minute, we just hit two standard deviations above baseline on arousal. What happened right before? What happened right after? Do you see what that will give you? This is continuous. This is not a laboratory measure now. This is continuous 24-7 monitoring. That's what I'm gunning for here. Continuous monitoring, okay? Um, what will happen is you'll look right before. When it, when it shot up two standard deviations, you say, oh my God, the mother changed the routine. So look at the videotape. The mother changed the routine. Okay? Uh, what happened after the arousal started accelerating? Okay? Now you're looking at the visual again. Oh my God, the kid started showing precursor behaviors. Or, or, or rather, what he's doing now must be his precursor behaviors. They're so weird, but when we keep playing uh, one anxiety context after another, we keep seeing the same precursor behaviors. So for that child, you're building up a profile of context, a profile of arousal, a profile of precursors, and eventually a profile of problem behavior. You have individual profiles for each child. Across children, they will not replicate because every child will have their own profile. But it doesn't matter because as long as each child is consistent, that's their signature. And by the way, this is exactly what's happening in medicine. I've had this conversation with Martha, and it's really been a, a real eye-opener for both of us. There's an area of medicine, I, I assume, that when she, she preceded me here, I know, uh, she's talking about functional medicine, it's sometimes also called personal medicine. They're saying, don't focus on a person's diagnosis, focus on their underlying molecular biology. Molecular biology is causing medicine to move towards an N of 1 model. No more, everybody that has asthma gets beclomethasone. No. 
That's garbage. It depends on what the underlying mechanism is. Ten different people with asthma may get ten different things depending on what their molecular biology or metabolic issue is. See? This is the same thing. So ten people can have autism or ten people can have various arousal. It doesn't matter. What matters is that within each child there are signature profiles. Okay? Now, what you would look for is this. You'd look for two things in arousal when you're analyzing arousal. You'd look for temporal uh, um, consistency, which means you might see peaks at certain times of the day. That could indicate, for example, GERD. Because 30 minutes after you eat, if you eat the wrong food, you tend to get severe reflux. So if you saw it peaking 30 minutes, you know, after 30 minutes after breakfast, 30 minutes after lunch, 30 minutes after dinner, you'd be thinking, my God, there's a temporal consistency here. It could be medical. It could be something like GERD. Or it could be, look like this, which looks random. Or, or, and it could be actually from day, like this is day one, maybe day two, I just want to show you. Day two, you know, looks like this. And you say, oh my God, there's no connection. Day one and day two are completely different profiles. We're doomed. There's no consistency. Wrong. Here you'd look for situational consistency. And you'd be looking and say, although on day one there's an X here, X here, and X here, and on day two there's an X here and X two here, and although they all, all those X's occurred at different times on the two days, we noticed that when you examine what X was, it was always crowding and noise. So although temporally there's no consistency, situationally there is. So it wouldn't matter if the profiles of arousal were fluctuating randomly from day to day as long as there was situational consistency, which is no matter when those X's appeared, it was always a particular context or limited number of contexts. See? So you could, you, could, uh, you could analyze these profiles in terms of temporal consistency or situational consistency. And uh, obviously analyze them in terms of these four variables. So now you're developing, you're developing profiles uh, for people. Um, all right, so how would you interpret these profiles? Well, you'd have to study carefully what the context is, and that would give you an idea of why the person was aroused, right? So, for example, if the profile was, you know, something bad happened medically at X, you'd think, gee, maybe that's why they're in a state of arousal. Then you'd also have to look very, very important. Here's where we really need help, okay? I believe you'd have to look very, very carefully at their face and their body language. Those are additional cues that help you to interpret arousal. So if, and now this would be easy, of course, if it were, uh, if it were university, true, it's not. But if you see with that camera, you notice the kid going <laughs> like that, that's quite different than like that, okay? The first one is uh, very likely fear or anxiety. The second one is very likely pain. Now, that's for typical people. Will it transfer it to people with autism? I don't know, but it may not matter because as long as people with autism did the same type of pain thing and the same type of anxiety thing, even if it was weird, as long as it's consistent, then that gives you their particular facial um, cue and body language for their version of anxiety and their version of pain. See? So that works. Yes? Um, I have a question about the conceptualization of putting together N equals one set of groups and sort of yeah. restricting observing the data to that. So it seems like um, it's a possibility that if you look at people with autism with sort of fine enough instruments, like if you're constructing profiles like this, you might end up with like groups of profiles that once you have a hundred of them instead of like three, yes. then you can actually divide it that way and then pull out lessons for other groups of people who may not be able to go to a university and get set up for it and, you know, monitor 24-7 and actually develop the profile and give some information to those people that the parents can't afford it, the parents can develop the right. parents can't afford it. Is that something that you're thinking about doing, like, in a, in a broader scope of this work? Or well, I, you really okay. Want to equal ones? No, well, well the, Initially, it will all be an N equal one, okay? I don't mean literally N equal one. It'll be N equal one over and over for lots of different ones, okay? It's not literally N equal one. Um, it, if what you just said is true, that would be wonderful. If it turned out that if you did 120 participants and uh, 40 of them had profile X, 40 had profile Y, and 40 well, had profile Z, you'd think fabulous. 40 different ones. Hmm? Yeah. I was even thinking that once you sort of get the fine-tuning all that stuff, right. you know, Exactly, whether in a right. situation that right. this response, whether right. in a right. situation that this response. It, it could, but I'm going to tell you. I'm, right. Right. It's very exciting, yeah. Sort of 
fine grass. Okay. Yeah, it, that could be the case. But what happens if it's not the case? Uh, what happens if, in fact, every person is unique and different things set off different people? This way of conceptualizing it addresses that. It's not a catastrophe. Your concern is a practical one. You're saying, well, could everybody come and take their kid to a... Well, you know, quite frankly, that same problem is in medicine. And so, therefore, it's not unique to autism. And so, if that's what it takes, that's what we will have to do. Uh, if your dream comes true, that would be wonderful because it would be extremely efficient and we'd be able to do that. My own pal uh, gut feeling, based on an N of 4,000 and not 100, <laughs> um, is that I suspect that there will be wide distribution. And in fact, this leads me to a, a different uh, related point, which is this. Here's what I'd really like to do to start the ball rolling. What I'd really like to do uh, is environmental sampling. Mm -hmm. I'd like to take a person uh, and purposely expose them to 120 different life situations <laughs> with this technology because I want to see what makes you tick. And 120 situations that are common for your family, in your neighborhood, in your situation, and then I will develop a profile for you. Now, you're here in Massachusetts. It might, not be, it might be quite different for somebody in Ohio or California. It might be a different community, different person, blah, 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 that kind of thing. And so, you know, um, but that won't matter because as long as I sample ecologically valid and meaningful situations for you, I will get a sense of what makes you tick. And then I can communicate that. That was one of the questions. Um, I can communicate that to your mother, to your teacher, to doctor, to babysitter. Okay, listen very carefully, oh babysitter who's new to our family. Okay, when my child does this, okay, that's a pre that means they're anxious. Uh, and we have found that when they do that, you should do X and not Y. On the other hand, if they do that, I'm sorry, no, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, but the second one was anxious. When they do this, um, I have to tell you that my child has intestinal dysbiosis, uh, imbalance of good and bad gut, gut flora, and so they're experiencing abdominal pain. Here's what you must do. So what I'm getting at is you're giving people very specific information about how to respond. Decoders. Decode, exactly. And I, and I don't want to be demeaning about this, but it's an exact parallel to the work of Tinbergen and Lorentz on animal behavior. It's, that's where this actually came, comes from. At the start of my career, I told you I was in experimental psychology, not clinical. And so um, they basically were, co you know, I'll give you an example. I'll give you an exact, exact, exact example. Uh, when my son was younger, we still have her, we have a lop-eared bunny. Um, and um, when you look at her body language, you can figure if you know the code of lop-eared bunnies, it enables you to uh, be more effective with them. Um, if they're on the floor and their back leg is completely stretched out, that means they're totally calm. If they're sitting on the floor and their legs are tucked under but both ears are down, they're moderately calm. If one ear is up, it means they're curious. If two ears are up, it means they're fearful. If they make a loud, gro uh, a small, low-frequency gro uh, growl, that means they're about to attack. If you know all those things, then you know that when um, one ear is up and they're curious and you put your hand near their mouth, they'll sniff because they're curious. When she growls and you put your hand near, you will get bitten. Okay? So that sort of logic, which is drawn from mythology, is exactly what I'm talking about here. You're creating a code for people with autism, except it's not species, it's N of 1. We're running out of time. Yes, we are. And you may want a few concluded remarks. I have another question that probably can't handle real quickly, and we can tackle it over lunch, but maybe you could say just something about it, which is um, placebo and all these Placebo. Things. How do you, what, so any intervention, you know, um, usually Hawthorne effect, right? Right. Um, people do better, maybe people are nicer to the kid. Maybe, right. You know, all these other things. Right. I was thinking about reading this, you know. Right. Um, how, how do you handle that in your single subject? Design? Well, you're talking about placebo effect with respect to treatments. Yeah, with respect so to treatments. So we're doing a particular treatment, and the person gets a lot better, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it, it's, a, it's a good question. There are things called reversal designs, uh, for example, mm -hmm. where uh, you pull the treatment out, and then the behavior collapses. And that's what you're doing with the right, study. exactly. Okay. And then you put the treatment back in. And it's the same thing with the demands, no demands slide I showed. 
you could say, well, maybe that's just fortuitous or whatever. But if you keep replicating it, you know, when X is there, the person explodes. When X is removed, they don't. X is back in, they explode. Uh, um, so it seems like instead of removing that treatment, you could put in another sort of sham treatment. And you can also put in sham treatments, that is correct. Um, usually, uh, the sham treatment is already present in the baseline. In other words, you say that's like, this is how we normally do it. But when you do uh, a treatment, for example, where you actually increase the rate of attention to the person, mm -hmm. okay, people could say, well, it's not the treatment. It's just that in the course of the treatment, you are paying a lot more attention to the person. So what you can do is you can do um, a sham treatment where you're paying more attention to the person, but the essential elements of treatment are missing. So now you're controlling for attention level. Mm -hmm. So there's various things you can do within a single subject design to kill that off. Um, and obviously it would depend on the nature of the treatment, what the sh appropriate sham would be. Um, so that's... But this uh, reversal, you know, putting it in, taking it out, putting right. it in, taking it out, and maybe putting the, in something that has some elements but not others. And, you, like and people can do that. Uh, and actually that's called dismantling, by the way. That uh, What I propose in terms of treatment is always multi-component. And when you do a multi-component treatment, people say, well, how do you know all the components are effective. Maybe only some right. of them are and some of them are garbage. You say, well, okay, well, you can pull them in and out and see, you know, does the behavior collapse when you pull certain things out, but it's terrific when you put them in. That would imply that, okay, those, treatment X and, X and Y are the effective elements. P and Q are just irrelevant correlates and of no interest. Mm -hmm. And so you could dismantle. Yes. 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 So, uh, according to the arousal profiles, um, the caretaker would be responding to the precursor um, uh, yes. signals instead of the problem behavior. So, okay. um, would is there? Do you think there is a chance that the child might start learning to use the precursor behavior to get what they to, to address? Oh, I see. What you, that's good. Okay. This this raises a whole very important issue that I didn't that you cued me on. Okay. When you have a model that says that there are three things that are actually relevant here. There's context, there's precursor, there's arousal. All these things precede problem behavior. It means there's three different opportunities for you to design treatments. You could alter the problem context, thereby avoiding subsequent problems. You could alter the arousal level, thereby avoiding, or you could alter the precursors. So you don't respond to the precursors. And I, I actually published on two, or three, two out of the three of these. The only thing I have not published on is arousal. That's why I'm here. Uh, the context and precursor I've published on. Um, what you do with the precursor is you don't allow the person to have the precursor pay off. And, and Well, OK. If the precursor uh, is this, OK, and that's going to lead momentarily to an explosion, what you say is, oh my God, the kid is anxious. I'm now going to teach the kid to say, I'm afraid. What happens is the precursor then falls. I just published this now. It's coming out in a month. What happens is the precursor falls out and communication replaces it. So now, because of that, the, person, uh, the adult offers appropriate support. The anxiety is reduced, and you never come to the problem behavior. So, it's, it's how you respond to the precursor. And what we do, basically, is we try to replace the precursor with another behavior that allows the kid to address their anxiety state by, by eliciting support from adults. So basically teaching you ways of expressing... It's exactly the same. That's right. It is, it, all, the, all these things, are like precursor and problem behavior, are functionally equivalent, it's called. In other words, they serve the same purpose which means if you give the person another way of serving a particular purpose, the old way will become unnecessary and irrelevant. And that's essentially the logic behind what's called functional communication training. So that's right. But yeah, I, thanks, thanks for raising the more generic thing, which is that there are actually three different opportunities to intervene based on this model. Three different generic opportunities. Uh, and every one of them has in the literature certain rational treatments that you could do prescriptively. That's all you need is a model to bring it all together and a technology that allows you to do the model. And that's this place. <laughs> okay? So thanks very much for coming and your attention. It's good. Thanks.